Hey, hi everyone and good day again. I, I hope that you enjoyed the yesterday lecture and today we have another interesting topic and important in astrophysics at, at, at least, so it's about gravity. And uh, Christoph is going to talk about uh, embody simulation for us today. So uh, as a quick introduction of Christoph, so uh, Christoph did his PhD in 2005 in Tübingen uh, and after that he decided to go to industry. So he worked for five years in industry and then in 2012 he returned again to science as a postdoc uh, in Tübingen University and now he is the head of numerical particle, particle method group in Tübingen. Yeah. And uh, he's expert in SPH, as you heard from our chat here. So please, Christoph, so time is yours. OK, thanks, thanks a lot. Thanks, Tari, for the introduction, for the nice introduction. Again, thanks for the whole opportunity to talk here, to show some of my experience, especially here with n-body modeling. Um, I've just tried to start sharing my screen, and I can't see it on my uh, second screen here, yes. Can you already see the shared screen? Yes, we see your screen. Yes. You, we, you see, okay, then just I don't see my screen on the second, second thing. Okay, so the, the basic idea here today is to start with n-body modeling. Later we can also have a look at uh, on smooth particle hydrodynamics. That was the part that Willi Klei uh, wanted to show yesterday but the time ran out um so we have some backup slides for sph if you like otherwise we would now start with n-body modeling um and i have also prepared this small website uh, which you find in the link in the chat from hussein thanks for that and in the email from yesterday and there is also uh, a link to the slides as they are now this is a pdf version of the slides and some exercises that we have prepared for the workshop. Um, if you look at them, these exercises, then you see here some well, small content about the n-body problem and the solution of the uh, two-body method, um, two-body problem, and then some more simple um, time integrators, uh, of which we will also talk about later, and then a small introduction into the n-body code rebound, and then the exercises that should be done or can be done with rebound, with some code snippets in C and in Python, whatever you prefer. Um, so this is principle, uh, what you can do then tonight or tomorrow or what we can do together starting later after the slides. Just want to point out that if you're looking for uh, more literature, then I have links to all the papers, important papers by Hanno Rhein, the author, the developer of Rebound here in this exercise script. This is now there, I think it's eight papers now. The last one is, I guess it's submitted. I, I think in the meantime it's also now accepted, uh, which you can read to get more insight into Rebound. Today I can really only give a short introduction. Um, you can do much more things and especially the integrators are much more sophisticated than the integrators that I present today. Okay, so have a look at the site and if you have any questions then just write an email to me or uh, yes can get in touch. Okay, we will look about the uh, on the rebound documentation later on again. So just for you to get to see your setup, here's my laptop. There's another screen. That's why I all, all, sometimes I have also to look there. And um, okay, good. So now the end body modeling, here's the topics that I want to talk today, what we want to do in the next four hours or 
Sorry, you, you interrupt me when we have to do the break, please, because I have no watch here. <laughs> so we will start with the slide theory part. I will talk about the classical astrophysical n-body problem. Um, then we will talk about exact n-body schemes and time integrators for uh, collisional systems. Then I will have a, a small example about um, inexact or um, approximated n-body schemes like the tree algorithms by Barnes and Hutt. I think you will learn more about these um, methods uh, tomorrow when, when you talk about, when you learn about self-gravity, for example, in disks. Then I have uh, some slides about the rebound integrator package by Hanno Rhein, which is a great software package with a Python and C interface, which can be easily used to do own simulations and which is a good basis for own codes, maybe so. And then a second part, the hands-on exercises part, don't know if we, what we're going to do, if we have enough time, we will start with the easy two-body problem, then go to some few-body problems, integrate um, some um, n-body choreographies. Then um, there's a paper about the Saturn's ring stability by Van der Bij, where we can easily study if we get the same results and from the paper from Van der Bij using rebound. And eventually in the end, if you want to run a simulation that takes probably longer, um, on a laptop or a workstation, there's an example of how to get the Kirkwood gaps in the asteroid belt using rebound. Um, you will have, probably have to run the, your, the simulation then for more than several hours. Uh, I've ran it last night for half an hour and I could simulate 1000 years and you get already some changes and you see something happening, but uh, it's probably a simulation that takes more time. Something that you have to get used to if you're doing um, n-body simulations. Normally, these n-body simulations take quite some time. Um, okay, so the goal for today is you learn some basics about time integrators. I will not talk about the very new, most sophisticated 11th order symplectic integrators that were introduced uh, to rebound last year. Um, if you're interested in that, read the papers. Um, and the second goal for me, which is very important, I don't only want to teach you some theory, but also that you get familiar with rebound, uh, because in my opinion, it's the, a, a very easy to learn software package and the, the best choice nowadays if you start uh, doing n-body simulations for collisional systems, that is planetary um, stuff, for example, or star clusters. Not for collisional system as um, galaxy formation or something, but if you're looking at, for example, Kirkwood gaps or small bodies. Okay, but let's start with the classical astrophysical n-body problem. What do we have? We have a number of n particles that interact classically. So there is no relativity today. We have uh, no um, relative uh, high velocities and no high masses. So we don't need, need general relativity. We have classically Newton's law of motion and Newton's law of gravitation. So for example, we have here um, these, these, do you see my pointer? I don't see if you see my pointer, that's a little bit annoying. We have here a, a star cluster with uh, red stars and one yellow star. And if you want to know the orbit or the movement of this yellow star, then you have to calculate all the gravitational forces from the other stars on this yellow star. And then you get the acceleration here, uh, d2, second derivative of the location, which is given by Newton's law. Uh, and then you integrate this with the time integrator. For n equals 1 and n equals 2, for n equals 1, only one star, this is trivial. For n equals 2, the equation of motion can be solved analytically. As we will see later, even for arbitrary n, um, there is a mathematical solution. 
um, which is practically useless, but we'll talk about this later. But that's the, the main problem. That's all, already everything. We have point masses acting gravitationally. And we want to um, know the new positions after a certain time. So we have many applications of gravity because gravity is everywhere. As you know, for example, we have a few body systems with only numbers, number, number range up to 10, for example, planetary system, which you see here is a, a sketch uh, overhead view of orbital positions of the planets and system of uh, which were um, discovered by the Kepler mission. And there is Kepler 21, Kepler 27. I don't know, probably Sari knows which one is which, but I don't know. See here all different kinds of um, planetary systems. And here you can fit the, feed this in a, your and body code and look for resonances, test for stability. Okay, there's a picture by Dan Fabitsky from the UC Santa Cruz. And so far, well, probably also know we have found a lot of planetary systems here with planets up to eight planets here, our solar system <clears throat> and the Kepler 90 system. We have the Trappist system with seven planets. Um, so one can put or study these planetary systems with an n-body code. Look what happens uh, if you integrate the system for several years and look at the stability. Um, then if you go to more particles, let's say several hundred um, here, you see our solar system on the right hand side. You see um, a video from the MPC from the Minor Planet Center in 2011, which shows uh, the inner solar system. The outer planet here is Jupiter. And you see here the Earth, the blue dot is Earth. You see Mercury, Venus, and Mars. What we see are is um, the asteroid belt between Jupiter and Mars, the green dots, and we see the, the red dots, which are the near-Earth asteroids. <clears throat> and maybe you can see, uh, probably hard to see, the blue dots, the Trojans, before and after 60 degrees on the Lagrangian points of Jupiter here. So how this is modeled or integrated is that you have interacting n bodies these are the planets and these minor bodies are put in the code just as uh, massless particles that uh, then interact gravitationally not with them themselves but only with the larger bodies so in this sense you can study the dynamics of these objects the formation of these trojan families um, which are mainly driven by Gravity. Okay, then you can go, of course, uh, gravity is the dominant force in the universe. You can go to larger n-body systems. If you want to study globular star clusters here, this is Messier 80. This is a Hubble image. I don't know from which year. I guess it's already older. It's from probably 20 years old, an old Hubble image. Um, what you see here on the right hand side, this is, uh, has a spatial diameter of several hundred lights here, or 100 light year, I guess. And you see 100,000 stars. Um, so this, this stellar swarm is one of the densest, one of the densest known globular clusters, but it's um, not so dense that you can do something like a continuum ansatz to model this. You really have to, to integrate each star for itself so the, it's a gravitation uh, collisional system so the interaction between two stars is important for the whole dynamics of this of the globular cluster which in, which means that you have to integrate or to solve the whole uh, system exactly with an exact n-body integrator if you have 10 to the 5 stars this um, is really well 
cumbersome and uh, we need high performance codes to integrate such high numbers for a long time. Um, yeah, you can go even higher now to more, more number, higher number of n and end up with simulations of the large scale structure of the universe. What you see here now on the right hand side is the simulation of the illustrious, the next generation simulation, which is made with Arepo, um, where people start or uh, um, investigate the large scale structure, the formation of the large scale structure of the universe and look at the galactic dynamics. These are not exact n-body simulations anymore because the number of uh, particles is way too high. You cannot do this on modern day hardware and you probably can't do this 10 years from now. So here we have approximated n-body uh, methods, something like three particle mesh um, or you solve the Poisson equation, something that you will learn tomorrow, I guess, or the day after tomorrow. Um, so this is then used, approximated n body. Mm. Schemes to solve these high number of uh, particles. Okay. So we have seen, as you probably have already known, applications here, gravity is everywhere. We have what we call celestial mechanics is if we're dealing only with many body systems, let's say less than several hundred, and we can also put some tracers in. These tracers are these massless particles that do not act on the mass particles, uh, where you can study planetary systems or the formation of asteroid families, formation of moons, or let's say planetary rings. Then we have large n-body systems where you need uh, exact n-bodies because collisions are important, which, is, uh, which are dense stellar systems. And then you have uh, large n-body systems where you can use an approximated n-body solver where you can and where you have to use an approximate n-body solver because the number of particles is so high that you cannot deal it um, with nowadays hardware. Mm. And in between there is also uh, coupled uh, systems. For example, you can also do a few body system with tracer particles that have an, a mass in the end, which you deal with a approximated uh, and body solver. Okay, today we will talk only about celestial mechanics because for this higher large numbers you need uh, more sophisticated codes. Now I'm, I wouldn't say it this way, but you need high performance computing hardware and uh, there's let's say special codes to tackle this. Okay, so We'll start with direct n-body now, which means uh, exact n-body. We have a set of n second order differential equations. Uh, here, this acceleration is given by the gravitational interaction between all particles. So if you want to have the acceleration of particle i, you have to sum up all gravitational forces from all other R particles J. We convert this, we transform this into a 2n dimension sets of first order differential equations. Here, we are simply the velocity is the time derivative of the location and the time derivative of the velocity is the acceleration. So now we have 2n uh, of first order differential equations. And we have an initial value problem. So we have also to know the initial conditions. Where are our stars or planets in the first place at some time t naught? And then we want to know where are the uh, planets and which are the velocities after some time delta t or at a later time t1. 
So you have also to know the initial position, positions and the velocities. And already this can be quite cumbersome uh, and you have to do a little, well, thinking about your initial conditions. For example, think about what are the initial conditions of stars in, in a star cluster. So there are already some models uh, for, for these kinds of questions. Mm. Okay, I said uh, just a minute ago, I said uh, that there is an um, analytical solution for n equals 1 and n equals 2. There is a global solution for the whole n-body problem. This is a paper of a PhD student which was accepted in uh, nearly 30 years ago in celestial mechanics. Um, and there's a whole mathematical description. You can write down a mathematical solution to the n-body problem in the collisionless um, um, collisionless um, case. So you have no singularities because this is singularities are always hard to handle in mathematics. So if you avoid singularities, you can write down a global solution which is in principle a power series, a Laurent series. And um, now you may ask, why do we just don't use this uh, analytical solution then? And if you look at the paper, and they already state in, in, the, in the paper that um, the conclusion here gives a way to integrate the n-body problem. You get a useful solution in series expansion, but these series converge very slow. So you have to sum up, sum up an uh, arbitrary, no, an incredible number of terms, even for approximate solution, first order, yeah, in, in, in the canonical uh, coordinates Q, P, and T. So this makes it slower than integrating it, um, the, the, the Newton's law equation in the first place. So um, if you're interested in, in the mathematical history of the n-body problem, because there, there's a, there was a prize by King Oscar, uh, the king of Norway and Sweden, which was later than one by Poincaré, then I have here the link to a paper by Florin Viaccio, who, talked about, who talks about the, this, the history, history of um, the n-body problem. So, as you see, there is a mathematical solution, but for us physicists, is probably, I mean, it's nice to know that we have convergence. We don't always have this. For example, if you do a numerical hydro, then maybe not obvious that the equations converge. We now see here that if you don't have collisions, we have a mathematical solution, but we cannot use this mathematical solution because it's numerically just too slow. It's a computational effort is too high. So what we do is that we integrate the equations of motion. And for this, we have the time integrators. And there are different kinds of time integrator. Here's just the simplest one. Um, probably you all know this, the simple Euler integrator, where we start here at the time Tn and want to the location and position later in time, Tn plus one. And we simply um, approximate the, the new step by taking the derivative here, which is in one case the velocity, in the other case the acceleration, and approximate the slope here and get one time step with this um, simple slope at point at time in point Tn. Okay, what we always have here is that you want a high accuracy and you want low computational costs. So you want to the scheme to be very fast, but you want to be high accurate. Um, if you look at the errors now, in such a case, the Euler integrator is a second order integrator, which means that the error term uh, is in second order. Uh, so Euler integrator is a first order integrator, first order correct, and the error term is of second order. Then you see that um, the discretization error goes linear, 
Okay, so the longer your time step is, the higher is your um, is your error of the, the scheme. But apart from that, you all also have a machine accuracy, which is given by the floating point arithmetic. So, for example, if you take uh, doubles or, or floats, then you get a, a rounding and truncation error for each time step. And the smaller your time step is, then this machine error, the accuracy, the truncation and rounding errors sum up and you get a higher error and the smaller your time step is. So you get, if you add all both errors up, you get this total error here, the orange line, which gives you a minimum at some ideal time step. This is the time step which is ideal for your uh, integrator. And if you look, for example, at this time step and you want to integrate the Earth-Sun system with this simple Euler integrator using double precision, which is a 10 to the 15 accuracy, then you see that after simulation time of 10 to the 5 years, you get already 10% error in energy. Okay, so you can simulate the, um, the Earth-Sun system for 100,000 years and afterwards, I would say, your simulation is useless. You cannot do better with the same integrator. Just you would have to use, let's say, quad precision and then a smaller time step, which, of course, then takes much longer on the machine to run. OK, so this is the case why people started to well, develop more and more sophisticated uh, integrators. And there are also I mean, this is uh, still a vivid field. There are new integrators invented each year, for example. If you look at the, also in the papers on AstroPH, and we have different ideas for new integrators once a year. And um, new integrators are also implemented in the main software packages, not only in Rebound. But here, I've tried to classify them in three different categories and um, we will have small examples for each category later on. So first we have here on the left hand side the so-called one-step methods. So this is Euler and the famous Runge Kutta method which you may also know so later on for this. This simply means that your new values at some time later n plus one are given by your old values plus one uh, your time step times a increment function. So you're doing exactly one step. So your new times, your new value just depend on the old values from one step earlier. We have here the example of the Euler integrator here on the left panel below. So here the new values just depend on the old values from Tn. Then you can have multi-step methods. Famous methods are here the adams bashford methods or Hermit integrators. Nystrom integrator. I've got here one example from the Valet integrator. Now, in this case, the new values at the new time, yn plus 1, depend not only on yn, but also here on a function that can de depend on many steps before up to q minus one here in this case so what you try to do here is to use also the information that you have calculated before in your simulation uh, so in principle you use more information in the system that you have already <clears throat> gained one example here is the valet integrator where you calculate new positions r to new time not just by looking at now n, but also at the old position in minus one. This is a time integrator, uh, especially for n body that doesn't make use of the velocity. So you calculate directly uh, new positions just by using the acceleration. Then there is a very interesting class of, uh, of symplectic integrators, which is a subclass of geometric integrators, uh, something like Leapfrog, Wisdom-Hollmann, and there is a whole class on symplectic Runge-Kutta integrators. 
And the main thing here is that they integrate, uh, they are solutions to the Hamiltonian systems. And this is very interesting for us physicists because they automatically conserve energy conservation. Uh, they conserve energy by design. Um, one example which is often used is the leapfrog for n-body because it's straightforward and simple. And this is also the, I guess, the most simple integrator in, in, um, in rebound, for example. Well, you calculate the velocity and the, um, the positions at different space and time. And in, in this way, you get a symmetry in in the time development and the time evolution and from the symmetry you get the energy conservation. More about this uh, later. Okay, but let's first look at these um, time integrators as a whole. Yeah. So what do we have to solve initially? We have uh, the following problem. You have here, this can be a time derivative or whatever, in this case is x could be also t. We have um, the slope or the derivative of a function y given in a certain inner interval and you have an initial value in this interval at the beginning of this interval of this function. This is y naught. You have a finite interval, this is what you have and you, have, you know the slope which is given by this function. Now we see a function y from x or y from t that is defined in this interval such that the derivative y prime is this function f from x. And this function f from x has all also to satisfy the initial condition. This y from a has to be y naught. This is the value that we have in the case for the n-body problem. This is our initial uh, positions and in initial velocity. So this is called in mathematics an initial value problem uh, compared to, for example, a boundary value, value problem where you have given um, the values at the, some boundaries. For example, if you look at the temperature evolution between two hot plates, let's say, and you have a plate of temperature T0 and a plate of temperature T1, and you want to know the temperature between the two plates, then you would have a, <clears throat> um, a ordinary differential equation with two boundary values. This would end up in a boundary value problem. But in the initial value problem, you have given here a differential equation which gives you the slope. Here, if you look here on the, on the right hand side panel, you see here a slope field which is a vector plot it shows the slope at each point x, y uh, and gives you an impression on how the system evolves. Okay, so all of, of your solutions are in this field and once you decide upon the initial value, this y naught, you get the, the different curves, integral curves. So depending on your initial value, you get the different solution. Um, Compared to our n-body problem, depending on the initial velocity or the, the initial position, you get also a different motion, of course. Okay, so now what's the basic idea between, from such a time integrator? If you go very simply, say, okay, we write this infinite uh, intervals, the x and the y of this derivative as finite intervals delta x and delta y, and then we discretize this interval with n points, and we walk from point to point with a certain step size. The step size uh, initially can just be constant, it can also be later on with um, variable step sizes, but initially we just say we have a constant step size, we divide our interval, and we go from uh, i to i plus 1 to i plus 2, and so on and so on or in this case from uh, k plus 1, uh, from k to k plus 1. So <clears throat> this is the initial idea and you can generalize this already and say 
this to write down the following form where the value of your new position or your new uh, value in the later on in the in the integral is given by the old one plus your uh, step size h times this increment function and this increment function can be anything we will see later on in the case of uh, the Euler integrator this is just f already but this can be more sophisticated which gives you higher order and better integrators and you just start from one value xk, go to xk plus 1, and one value yk, you go to yk plus 1, and use only the previous values. This is why it's called a one-step method. So if the right-hand side of this function here does not depend on yk plus 1, which means that the increment function is only a function of xk, yk, and h, your step size, then the method is explicit because you can directly calculate with all values that you have the values at your new point in time or point in space. You have already all the information <clears throat> that you need to calculate k plus 1. If this increment function also depends on the values at k plus 1, y k plus 1, then it's implicit because then you have to solve it iteratively. Okay, and as I said already, the function phi is an implement, uh, increment function. So, and again, our example with the Euler integrator, just the increment function is the function f itself, so this, the slope, and you get your new values just by taking the old values plus um, your um, step size times the slope at the old values. Okay, so basic idea of a uh, one-step method. Now we want to go on and have a look at the Runge-Kutta integrators, which are also one-step methods, but are of higher order. And we'll see the basic idea of these methods. So. The runge kutta methods are based on integration by Lagrange polynomials. And the basic idea is first that you write the ordinary, ordinary differential equation, the ODE, as an integral equation. You see this here. Instead of writing y prime as our function f, just write the integrate on both sides, and we obtain here the next line that our new on the solution at the new point in space or in time is given by the old one plus the integral of our slope function here this f function dx. Now <clears throat> the basic idea of the runge kutta integrator is that we solve the integral on the right hand side here this one by the help of polynomial expansion. First easy one would be now just for example, one can generalize this later to apply the trapezoidal rule with the step size of h xk plus 1 minus xk, so for each small interval, um, and use the approximation here. This is just a trapezoidal rule that the, um, that the integral of this y prime is given by h half times two values, both values at the beginning of the integral and at the end of the integral. Okay, so we use this approximation, this is approximation, um, for this value of this integral here on the right hand side. Okay, problem is now, as you may see it, that we have to know the slope at the end of this interval. So this y prime at xk plus 1. This is something that we don't know. Um, so we have to approximate this ag again. And we can do this easily, for example, with an Euler integrator step. So we have y prime at the beginning of the interval gives us some slope here, f, xk, yk, which we call k1. And we have something at the end of the interval, the slope at the end of the interval, which we call k2, 
which is given by the slope function xk plus 1 and yk plus 1. This yk plus 1 is not known, hence we have to uh, approximate it. In this case, we do it with a Euler step, yk plus h times k1, and k1 is simply just our slope function f. Okay, so what we get from here is a second order Runge-Kutta integrator, which is known as Hoyne's method. You calculate the, um, the slope at the beginning of the interval, and once at the end of the interval, where you use your approximation with an Euler step to get first to the end of the interval, and then you do a complete step by averaging the slope at the beginning of the interval and one at the end of the interval. So in principle, you have, have to do two times calculating the f function, so the force evaluation in the case of the n-body simulation. So we have more computational effort uh, as for a simple Euler integrator because you have to calculate more stuff here, this k2, you have to calculate the k2, but you get, you gain a higher order. You gain, so if you write down the error function of this integrator, then this is a second order and the error is a third order. Um, what I want also to mention here is that Hoyne's method is also um, uh, example for uh, a predictor corrector method, a method that we won't talk about today, but in principle is what you do is you do first a step and then you correct it afterwards. This is a predictor corrector method. So Hoyne's method is second order Runge Kutta and a predictor corrector method at the same time. Now you can as you may see, as you have seen probably now, is that you can gain more information in your interval by just executing more right-hand sides or calculating the force in the interval more often. Then you have, with each step, you have uh, more knowledge about the system. In principle, what you do is you um, you use a higher polynomial expansion of this integral, which means you have to evaluate the function value f in this interval more often, depending on the order of your um, polynomial expansion, but then you gain more information on the system and you get uh, a smaller error. And uh, just for the sake of completeness, uh, com com completeness I've added also the famous Runge Kutta integrator RK, RK4, which is so in, in, in technical applications, I would say it's the standard Runge Kutta integrator. So if you ask an engineer about a Runge Kutta integrator, he thinks or she thinks automatically about a RK4. And this is, I just want to sketch here you the functionality. This is by evaluating at four different uh, or at three different positions in your interval with four different force calculations or slope calculations, um, you you uh, integrate in space or in time. So you start here, let's say at xk. This is your one step from xk to xk plus one. This is the one step that you want to take. You start with a simple evaluation at uh, xk, calculating the slope here, which gives you this k1 slope. And with this k1 slope, you jump to the middle of the interval, to xk plus ha h half. Here, you do another evaluation of the slope function. You calculate the forces again, and you get a value k2. Then you go back to xk, integrate until again to the half of the interval, okay, with the k2, and end up here, somewhere here at this value, where you do another uh, evaluation of the right hand side or the forces. In the case of the n body, you get this k3 slope. And with this k3 slope, 
you jump back from xk and integrate to the end of the interval, which gives you here, uh, that let you end up here at yk plus hk times uh, h times k3. And you do another force evaluation here at k at xk plus 1, which gives you the slope k4. And in the end, your, your new step or the new values is given by a um, the summation, the sum of this, this weighted sum of this four different slopes. And there is a parenthesis missing here. Okay, think about the parentheses here. So you, you've got a weighted sum of these four slopes giving you the new positions um, or new values at the end of this interval. So this might look complicated a little bit, don't know, uh, but if you uh, know Python, Python, for example, then this is easily to program in just a few lines, for example, just for uh, for you to, to, to have a look. I've added here some lines. So this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So about less than 20 lines of code for a Runge Kutta fourth order integrator. Of course, if you do this in C, this would be a little bit more uh, to program because of the memory handling. It's quite forward and easy to implement even such an um, integrator with Python. You see here that we calculate this K4 values by uh, evaluating this function, right-hand side function. So F here is the function pointer which returns the derivative of these values and then we just sum up um, to get the new values. So even such a well more sophisticated integrator can be straightforward implemented, I would say. Pardon me, uh, Christoph. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for your great yeah. talk. Could you uh, just stop here and have some questions? Yeah, sure, sure. Okay, thank you very much. I categorize these questions. Uh, there, there are three questions. Uh, oh, I, are yeah. here, I, and then we have an oral question. Thank you. Okay. I, I see the, the question in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the chat. Okay, the question by Ibrahim Asani, question one. Does rebound code considers the dynamical friction in binary systems or mass transfer in binary or gravitational wave emission in compact binary systems? This is a very good question. Um, in principle, not per se, you can have dynamical friction. Okay. Um, mass transfer and binaries you can also implement this there is a, a nice add-on for rebound which was written by a postdoc uh, of Hanno Rhein um, which is called rebound x rebound extras uh, which implements gravitational wave emissions and so on gives also some hints on how you can do this yourself so in principle what we also see later if we can look at the code you can see that rebound can be easily, um, you can add your special functions or add-on functions, track forces easily to the code, uh, straightforward. There are even examples. So uh, if it's not in there, it would be not, let's say, it would be easy to add this to the code because it's very modular. Okay. Question two by Fatimi. If the code is used for planet formation binary system, depends. I mean, planet formation binary system, you can, uh, what the code does not do is uh, handling hydro. So if you have anything like uh, a, a gaseous disk, then no, then you need a hydro code, for example, like Pluto or so. What you can do, or uh, well, what we do is using rebound for late stage accretion. For example, if you have solid gravitational interacting particles, uh, and then can be used to model the collisions in between them. Uh, we will have, we will see later on a lot of examples about this. So wait and see when I present the code. But as soon as you have a gaze 
gas disc, then uh, rebound is probably not the first choice. So you can add artificial attract forces by some gas, but you don't have the, the evolution of gas around the star. Okay, so the third question, what is the main merit of rebound in terms of binary formation and evolution conversion with standard N-body? Uh, pardon me, uh, Christoph, uh, I think Vahid wants to ask his question orally. So Vahid, uh, please turn on your uh, microphone and ask your question. Thank you. Okay. Vahid Amiri, do you want to ask your question through your microphone? Okay, I think. Okay, uh, Christoph, could you please just uh, uh, go to question number three? It's by Vahid Amiri. Thank you. So what is the main merit of rebound in terms of binary formation and evolution comparison with standard N-body? Okay, you mean with standard N-body, probably uh, the standard N-body code um, by uh, acid. So in, in principle, uh, rebound is, I, I don't want to, to compare software packages in principle. What I've learned, uh, if you look, for example, at Mercury, uh, or other software packages, then the main benefit about rebound is first, it's very easy to learn because it, it has a nice Python interface. We will come to this later, but you can also do fast computation because the backend is in C. Uh, and it's, I think it's more modular. So you can easily add your own physics or your own problem to the code more easily than uh, compared to different N-body integrators or packages, but I mean, every, let's say, application has its special software package or solution. This is, um, so you wouldn't use, let's say, rebound to model uh, long-term uh, galactic structures or so. Uh, okay, right, now, yeah. Thank you very much. And now uh, I think uh, Mohammad Hosseini Raad wants to ask uh, his question. Okay. Uh, could you please go to the slide 15? 15? Yeah, sure. Oops. Yeah, yeah. Yes, uh, I think uh, here is, uh, there is a very remarkable point about the time step of uh, integration. Uh, because I think many people think that uh, uh, by decreasing the time step, uh, they will get a better solution. Uh, my question is that, uh, does it the case for, for other integrators, for example, uh, trapezoidal integrator, when, when they want to, for example, integrate a function, yeah? Okay. Does it the case? Yes, I mean, in principle, you have to always keep in mind as soon as you're doing long term simulations, how much is the, the error, the rounding error, the truncation error um, uh, of my simulation. This is, you always have to keep in, in, in mind this, this problem that you have a finite uh, floating point arithmetic and you cannot, let's say, uh, have arbitrary high um, accuracy. But what you can do is, you can do with numerical tricks, for, for example, with the compensated summing and stuff, you can minimize this error. And uh, you can even do what we will see also later. There's one uh, uh, neat integrator in rebound, the Janus integrator, which is bitwise complement. So uh, a bitwise correct integrator with tricks, you can minimize this machine error in a way. But, for example, if you look at the energy or long-term stability uh, of systems, then you're more interested in the energy and the angular momentum conservation and not so in, in, the, in the defined orbit, let's say. 
or in collisions. So you would use a symplectic integrator, which makes sure that the energy in the system is conserved. So it somehow depends on the application, okay? So there's for each application, there's the best choice of integrator, I would say. Um, I mean, the, the oil integrator is just good if you want to, let's say, do a, a short integration. It's very straightforward implemented. You haven't to have, don't have to do anything, just take the forces and add it up. Um, so there's also a reason for uh, the choice of the Euler method if you want to test something straightforward. Um, so, I mean, machine accuracy has always to be kept in mind. There is no, I think, no numerical method so far which just gets rid of any problems with this. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Vahid. Uh, you may now ask your question. Uh, thank you, Hossein. Thank you, Chris, for your talk. Uh, I am uh, interested in rebound, <laughs> actually, <laughs> in the features for paralleling. And uh, I have uh, one question. Uh, does any feature in your code uh, for uh, calculating the steps for binaries, as you know, the steps for uh, uh, calculating the evolution and forma formation and evolution, the binaries must be small size and in comparison with other parts of uh, the cluster, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, does, does any feature in your code uh, for the uh, for for this process and calculating the features of the binaries uh, and in uh, other in uh, other loops? Uh, the code goes to calculate other parts of cluster without any looking on looking at the uh, binaries. Uh, you know, uh, I, for, uh, okay. my, my question is, uh, consider the binaries in one loop, for example, and other parts in other loops. Some features looking okay. this. Yeah, okay, okay. I know that, okay, I, I think I get the idea what you want to do. Uh, I have to say that I'm not sure about this, okay? But I think that Hanno Ryan has just implemented a new kind of integrator, which is already in the repository that splits up uh, the binary part, if you have a, a binary, from the gravitational action of smaller. But the, the, these, these objects have, have, have to be uh, less massive than the binary. Um, so you can see the the you have the binary and the the, the pl let's say planets or other stars which are less method as a disturbance. There are new integrators, especially for this kind of problem, but I haven't used them yet. So maybe we have to look at the documentation then, or uh, write Hanno directly. I guess it's submitted already in Rebound now, but not that it's used already. I, I'm not aware of this. Thank you, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. And now uh, we have uh, the final question. Uh, it is asked by Fatima. Uh, and uh, I think she means if there is any, per, uh, any initial condition for this code, but uh, yeah, uh, if there is any initial condition for this code. You could uh, see this question by a uh, number by... Okay. Mm -hmm. okay, thanks Fadimi for this question. The thing is, is there, are there any initial conditions for the code? Uh, you mean, I mean, there are functions in the code, for example, to calculate the Blommer sphere for an initial globular cluster. Um, and there are different, well, yeah, I'm not aware of anything else. Um, no, but we will see this later when we do an example, I guess, how you add your uh, n-bodies to the simulation. In principle, there are some functions, for example, to calculate the uh, plumosphere uh, for a, a star cluster. I'm not aware of many others, I think. Uh, for example, in the Kirkwood gap exercise, later you can see that we have a, the Sun, we add Jupiter and Mars, I, I guess, yeah, Jupiter and Mars, and then we distribute with um, 
some arbitrary random inclinations and, and uh, initial conditions, trace of particles um, with different um, semi-major axes. And this is just added randomly with, with um, numpy numerical Python. So um, we have initial conditions for some star clusters, but the rest you have to implement yourself, I guess. Okay. Good. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, well, I think we uh, we need a break, so uh, let's break for fifteen minutes. Uh, okay. We'll come back at uh, twelve forty-five uh, Iran local time, and I think it's ten fifteen with me. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I just make a short notice here, but uh, please remember we have to save the room and exit exit the room then we come back okay okay thank you very much thanks uh thanks christoph thank you see you in a minute see you <laughs>